Good morning, all, and welcome to the That's So Gay, Preventing and Addressing Anti-Gay and All Forms of Bullying webinar. My name is Brandi Brooks, and aside from being the moderator this morning, I am a contract manager for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Suicide Prevention Program, the sponsors of this webinar. Before I introduce our presenter, Marissa Howard Karp, I would like to go over a few housekeeping issues. First, should anyone experience any technical difficulties with either the audio or video for this webinar, please dial 1-800-843-9166. Again, that's 1-800-843-9166. And a ReadyTalk representative will be more than happy to help. Second, all telephone lines are muted. Let me repeat that. All your telephone lines are muted except mine and Marissa's. So please use the chat function to type in any questions you may have. Given the number of participants, Marissa will do her very best to answer as many questions as possible as we go along and at the end of the webinar during the question and answer period. Now that I've gotten that out of the way, let me introduce our presenter, Marissa Howard Karp. So Marissa morning. is the program director for the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender GLBT Youth Support Project, a program of health imperatives. She provides training and support for a wide range of schools and health and human service agencies to help them create safe environments and webs of support for GLBT youth. Marissa has presented on bullying prevention at conferences and agencies throughout Massachusetts and nationally. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Marissa. Thank you, Brandy. Good morning to everybody. Um, I want to start by just saying thank you to Brandy for pulling this whole thing together, for inviting me to do this. Um, there, was, there were a lot of logistics involved in this, and she has been great to work with. I also want to say that the response to the um, advertisement for this webinar was just overwhelming. So I'm really glad that you all are here. We will be offering this again several more times, and I'll um, talk a little bit more about that as we go. So as Brandy said, um, my name is Marissa Howard Karp and I'm the program director for the GLBT Youth Support Project. We are in Brockton, Massachusetts, about a half hour south of Boston, and I've been working with the program since 2002. Uh, bullying was not our original focus, and it has increasingly become more and more of our focus because the, the uh, connections between the work we were doing to create safe environments for GLBT youth and bullying just became so clear. My background is in community organizing, so it's also really fun for me to do trainings on issues like bullying because they really rely on community-wide approaches. So I want to give you a little bit of information about the program just to start with. We work to ensure safe and supportive communities for GLBT and questioning youth. So you'll hear me say GLBT, GLBTQ, LGBT. Uh, obviously, you all have your own ways of saying that. All of them are correct. And we offer a number of things. We offer training. We offer a number of different online trainings, including this one. And we offer on-site trainings throughout Massachusetts and somewhat on a national level as well. We also offer technical assistance. So we're happy to talk with folks around bullying and creating safety for GLBT youth in terms of developing policy, developing programs, troubleshooting, making referrals, all of those kinds of things as they come up. We do assessments, so we will work with folks around figuring out what kind of a job are you doing now? What are the things that you're doing that are already going well? And where are some areas where you really want to figure out some ways to do them better? And then finally, we offer a number of different resources. We have a monthly electronic newsletter. We have a number of cue cards, fact sheets, policy and position statements, information about best practices, all sorts of things like that all on our website. Of course, we're on Twitter and Facebook as well. I know that there are a number of agencies who are on the call today who are participating as a group. So if you are doing that and you didn't register yourself and we don't have your contact information, I would definitely encourage you to jump onto our website and um, let us know who you are so that we can um, get you all the follow-up materials and anything else you might need. 
Now, I noticed a comment just came through that somebody said they were having a little bit of a hard time hearing me. Is this getting a little bit better? Anybody want to let me know? I'm going to keep talking and do my best, and I'll wait to see if anybody speaks up. <laughs> so, okay, thank you for those of you who told me this is getting better. All right, I'll keep speaking up then. Let me know if it becomes a problem. So the first thing I want to know a little bit about is who is in the room. We have quite a group of people here. I just want to mention uh, we've got folks on the call from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Texas, Washington, Kansas, Oregon, California, Maine, New Hampshire, and South Dakota. Uh, that just includes the folks that I actually know about. We've also got folks who are representing health centers, youth centers, uh, child welfare programs, high schools and middle schools, violence prevention programs, family planning programs, a whole bunch of others. So I'm going to ask you to tell me a little bit about what it is that you do. Um, so there's a poll function, and I'm going to give you all a minute. And I'd ask if you could just fill in one of these so that we can get some information, um, mostly for you as much as it is for me, about who is participating in this call and who is really focusing on this issue. So feel free to just submit your responses and then click Skip to Results. Okay, now I saw there was one person who just left us a comment that says there's no audio. So if you could please let us know again if you're still not hearing anything right now. Um, otherwise, there's that phone number that's right up at the top of the chat window that you can call for some technical support. Okay, so there's somebody else who mentioned they're from Idaho. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Any more responses? We'll give it one more second here. So here's what we've got. I'm hoping folks can see this poll. So um, let's see, we don't have any elementary schools on here, but quite a few of you from high schools. Uh, like I said, middle schools, a few of you from colleges and universities, suicide prevention programs. Okay, great. Quite a few youth development folks. Let's see. Other community-based organizations, let's see, so somebody said the North Shore Alliance of GLBT Youth. Excellent. If anybody else wants to type in any specific programs that are not represented here, that would be great too. Okay, Idaho Safe Schools Coalition, excellent. GED programs, Youth Mentoring at Mass Mentoring Partnership. Okay, well look at this, they're coming right in. College Internship Program, Physician's Office, Independent Living Center, another mentoring program, Justice Resource Institute Health Programs, uh, let's see, some charter schools, a shelter for teen girls, excellent. So one of the things that this really says to me is really what a broad-based issue this is, how important this is. Uh, I see Rape Crisis Center and Domestic Violence Programs, all right, excellent. So I know I didn't get everybody there, but that gives us a little bit of a snapshot of who's here. I know it's a little bit hard on a webinar when you can't see other people's faces and actually get to introduce yourselves. So let me just go over our agenda briefly. This is my plan for now. I want to talk to you in just a minute and find out a little bit about what you've heard. And we'll use that same, that same uh, polls function that we just used, which it seems like worked pretty well for folks. We're going to talk about what is bullying? Because it's a word that we throw around all the time, but I want to make sure that we've really got a common definition. We're going to talk about the effects of bullying. So what does it actually do to youth? We'll talk about what are your goals for intervention and what are your goals for prevention? We'll spend some time talking about best practices, and within that we'll also talk about what are some things that don't work. And then we'll wrap up by doing a Q&A and um, any last minute questions. We do have a little extra time on this webinar, so our plan today is to go until 12.30. Um, it's possible that we may wrap up early, but if there are lots of questions, we do actually have until 1 o'clock. If folks want to stick around, I'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can. I want to say before we jump in with two feet, um, a quick note about cyberbullying. So, 
this is a short webinar, and bullying is a huge topic. And I want to just acknowledge that I'm not really going to be able to address cyberbullying to, today in the way that it deserves. And so rather than doing it a little bit badly, um, I want to just let you know that this is a really present issue for a lot of you who are working with youth. Cyberbullying can look very different than in-person bullying, but the nature of it in a lot of ways is actually very similar to in-person bullying. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today will still apply. If anyone's interested in more specific training on cyberbullying, I would encourage you to get in touch with me after this webinar. We do offer uh, in-person trainings and resources on the topic. And I'd also refer you to the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center, which is right here in southeastern Mass. I'll say that again. It's the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center. I would definitely encourage you to Google them. They have great research, great tools available online. And I understand that the director of that program is actually going to be doing a cyberbullying webinar in January as part of this suicide prevention series. So I would definitely encourage you to stay in touch with Brandy if you want to learn more about that so that you can be sure to get into that uh, webinar as well when it opens. So here we are. I want to know a little bit about what it is that you are hearing on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, I'm going to ask you to uh, use the poll function to answer some of these questions that are coming up right here. And this will give us a little bit of sense, again, of what your experience is. So let's start here. This should be an easy one for you. Have you ever heard someone say, that's so gay? So please respond. Oh, they're coming in quickly. This is great. I'll give it just a minute. Excellent. And of course, if anybody has trouble using the poll functions, just send the chairs a message, and uh, we'll try to help troubleshoot that. I'll just give one more minute. Looks like a bunch of them came in quickly. See if there are any stragglers. Okay. Look at that. <laughs> Every single person who responded to this said yes. So we're going to talk a lot more about what that means. Now let's do this one. Think about this a little bit. Since you all said yes, you all have an answer to this. How old was the youngest person you remember hearing that's, say, that's so gay? Okay, these responses are coming in and they're looking very telling. Okay, so here we are. We'll just give it one last minute here. Look at that. More than half of you reported that the youngest person you ever heard say this was under 10. <laughs> this stuff starts really early. A lot of you are hearing this from pretty young kids. You'll see that the numbers for even the 11 to 15 year olds is pretty significant as well. I mean, this really covers about 90% of you who responded. So this stuff starts really early, as do all different kinds of bullying, which is why it's really important to be thinking about this regardless of what the age group is that you're working with. So here's another one for you. Have you ever heard or used, I'm not asking you to impl implicate yourself, but heard or used phrases like, I was gypped, or that's ghetto? Okay, they're coming in, and I want to say thank you to all of you who are responding to these polls. It's great to be able to have this real-time information. So here we are. Almost, uh, let's see, we're at 90% of you said yes, that you've heard or used one of these phrases. So again, this is really in common language. Let's do a couple more. How about if you have ever heard somebody insult another person by calling them retarded? Now look at what we've got here. I have 100% of you. Now somebody had put in a question that says, what is the definition of bullying? And you're just a couple of steps ahead of me. We're going right there. So hold on to that. Thank you for asking. Uh, we are going to get there in a minute. So 
100% of you answered yes to this question. This is one we hear really frequently among young people, obviously. But of course, you know, this is not just about youth either. There was a big flap about it recently. Some of you might have read this. Uh, Jennifer Aniston actually used it when she was on Regis and Kelly. This is another one like That's So Gay that's really thrown around as a synonym for stupid. But of course, it has a much broader implication than that when we use it that way. Now, here's my last question for you. Uh, okay, somebody actually asked before I get there, how many people are listening and being polled? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's see, we've got 63 people on the call. Now, that's 63 people registered, though, again, a number of you are in conference rooms, so um, the actual number might be much higher than that. And um, we are asking everybody with a computer to respond to the polls. And it looks like we're getting between about 58 and 61 responses, so almost 100% of you who actually are on your own computer are responding to these. So now here's the last question for you. Have you ever thought of the perfect response to the situation an hour after it happened? Oh, I love these responses that are coming in right now. Okay, so look at where we are. <laughs> this is pretty universal. Okay, so the question was, somebody asked for clarification. So the question was, have you ever been on the spot and had a difficult time coming up with a good response, but then an hour later you thought, what I should have said is this? So obviously this goes for quite a few of us, and I'll share with you that you know I teach this, and I am the first to admit that I still struggle with how to respond effectively when I hear it. And when I talk about this, I always think about when I was 19, I had a job lifeguarding in a summer camp, and I heard a child call another child a faggot. So what did I do? I got right to my feet, I ordered him out of the pool, and with him standing in front of me, dripping wet with his towel wrapped around him, all I could manage to say was, we, we, we don't do that, we just don't, you just, you just can't say that. <laughs> So obviously this was not the most productive response, and I will say I probably spent my entire adult life trying to improve on it. But there it is. We all struggle with it. 100% of you told me that you struggle with coming up with a great response on the spot, but you all are here, and that tells me that you're struggling with it, but at least you're struggling with it productively. So. One of the things that I want to do is think a little bit about what are some of the things that we want to accomplish so that the next time this comes up, you don't need that hour. So let's talk a little bit about Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> One thing that I just want to say is um, that this exercise is not an exercise in political correctness. Right? This is not about being the thought police. I didn't ask you these questions to make you afraid to open your mouth. The point of the questions was really to get you to focus on how common this stuff is, how often we use words and phrases that have a real impact on people, and sometimes without even realizing what we're saying. So when I asked you to think about the youngest person who you remembered saying, that's so gay, you know, a lot of you came up again with kids under 10. So a third grader who says that somebody is gay, they may or may not know the actual meaning of the word it's likely that he's not actually accusing somebody of being gay. Maybe he is. But regardless, he knows it's a word that will hurt the person he's talking to. But the broader meanings do stick with us, even when it's years before we fully understand the impact. So let's talk about why this population. I developed this training because it was clear that gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender youth were facing really disproportionate rates of bullying. And I'll share some of those numbers with you in a few minutes. But one of the things that I love about this training is that efforts to address anti-gay bullying just go way, way beyond GLBT kids. They have a real impact on GLBT kids, but they go way beyond that. And they have an impact on every young person and every adult in a given environment. There's really three reasons for this. So first is that anti-gay bullying is somewhat unique in that it impacts a huge number of people directly. Now, all different kinds of bullying impact lots of people directly and lots of other people indirectly. When I say that this is a more sort of direct hit, you know, th of course this impacts kids who openly identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or questioning. It also impacts kids who are perceived to be GLBT, usually because they don't conform to strict gender expectations. So they don't fit neatly into the box of what we expect from a boy 
or neatly into the box of what we expect from a girl in terms of their dress, their presentation, um, how they speak with folks, how, you know, anything else, the kinds of things they like to do, who they hang out with. And of course, it impacts people who are associated with GLBT people, so friends, siblings, parents, anybody who's surrounding the person who's, who's the target. Second, anti-gay slurs are virtually stand-ins, I mentioned this before, for anything you want to put someone down for. So again, look at how many of you said you had heard somebody say that's so gay, 100% of you. So you'll hear kids who call homework assignments gay, shoes they don't like are gay, movies are gay. Now it's unlikely that the homework assignment is actually homosexual. To my knowledge, homework assignments have no sexual orientation. But because it's understood to be this universal way of insulting someone or insulting something, that's the word that gets used. So again, similar to the way that you'll hear kids or adults saying, we're targeted. Finally, this last piece of this is that the skills are the same regardless of what kind of bullying you're dealing with. So we know that kids bully other kids for just about any reason we can think of, right? Class, race, size, a million other reasons. So anytime you're honing your skills and improving your prevention practices in this area, of course it's benefiting youth and adults around you for all sorts of other reasons too. So none of the point of this is to say that this is worse for GLBT kids or kids who are perceived to be GLBT than it is for kids who are getting bullied for any other reason. The point is more to say that when we are able to address this well, we're able to address bullying issues well across the board because the issues really, there is so much overlap. So now let's get back to the definition of bullying. Make sure that we have some common ground. So this comes from Stop Bullying Now, which is part of HRSA. Bullying happens when someone hurts or scares another person on purpose, and the person being bullied has a hard time defending himself or herself. That's the definition at its most basic, and it can look like a lot of different things. So this is uh, where, okay, sorry, I have a note from Brandy here. So HRSA is the, oh, let me see if I can get the acronym right, the, the health, <laughs> Brandy, help me out here. <laughs> I always make a mistake on this on this acronym. It Health, is. Go ahead. Oh goodness. Oh. Health resource human <laughs> health resources and service association. I'm not sure if that's quite right, but um, they're an umbrella organization that deals with a whole lot of public health issues across the board. Um, if you take a look at this website, you will get lots of information from them um, about the bullying. And if you just go to hersa.gov, then you'll see more more about what they said. Thank you, Gina. Health Resources and Service Association. <laughs> okay, there we are. So this can take lots of different forms. Okay, now I'm looking at some of these questions that are coming in. Yep, okay, so somebody asked, isn't it supposed to be repeated? Absolutely. So it's not just a one-time thing, which would be considered a second sort of a um, it's not considered bullying until it's repeated. Um, I did notice somebody else asked, why is the second clause needed? Because the real issue is um, about how it's perceived. It's um, similar to sexual harassment. It's as much about how it's perceived as it is about the action. So somebody may act inappropriately, but if it's not perceived that way, it's not necessarily bullying, then it can be moved into sort of a context of inappropriate behavior. So. I want to talk a little bit about this. This is something that has come up a lot for many years when we talked about bullying. And I think that this has changed a lot, even in the time that I have been doing this kind of training. But we used to say kids will be kids, right? We all experience bullying. We all witness bullying. We were all the bullies ourselves, you know, one or more of those kinds of things. And it, it was something that we looked at really as a rite of passage. And I want to show you a few things that have really helped us look at this in a little bit of a different way. So this one will look very familiar to you. Uh, this is a photo from the aftermath of the massacre that took place in Littleton, Colorado at Columbine High School in 1999. Two students were systematically bullied and harassed, and eventually they stockpiled firearms and they killed 12 students and one teacher. Now I want to make sure that nobody thinks that I am justifying what happened. There's nothing that could ever justify this. When we look at it in the context, though, of these two kids having been bullied and harassed for years, and we do know what we found out after the fact is that the adults in the school failed to intervene even though they did know what was going on. When we look at it in that context, we understand a little bit more about what happened. 
This is Carl Joseph Walker Hoover. He committed suicide in April of 2009 after months of being taunted and called gay by his classmates. Now, Carl was 11. He was from Western Mass. And in 2009, this is a picture that will also look familiar to many of you, Phoebe Prince hanged herself. She was 15, and she committed suicide after having been bullied relentlessly. Her death actually sparked the passage of the recently passed Massachusetts anti-bullying laws, which are going to go into effect this winter and are now among the most comprehensive in the country. And we'll talk a little bit more about those as we go. This is a photo from a protest um, in the Anoka Hennepin County School District in Minnesota where there have been three suicides in one year, all by students who openly identified as gay or lesbian. All of these students dealt with ongoing harassment and bullying. So when we come back to this, you know, again, we say kids will be kids. I think what this says to me is we need to look at this a little bit differently. This is not a rite of passage. Bullying is not inevitable. It is not an easy thing to fix. But the reality is that we're seeing some very serious consequences from this, and we are looking at this a little bit differently. Now, I have a comment. Um, somebody was asking a little bit more about systematically bullied and harassed. This is regarding the two shooters in Columbine. Um, the evidence that comes from this, you know, it's very difficult to know this, the perception of the two shooters because, of course, they also died in the incident. Um, they both committed suicide after it was over. But the evidence says that they were systematically bullied, and um, based on what we saw and based on their response, we can only assume that they certainly did perceive it as bullying. Um, and again, I'm not the expert on this one, but this is uh, what some of the research has shown us. So um, just I want to take a minute before we get back into the rest of this to see if there are any questions specifically about that last piece. So somebody asked, are there numbers on how many children and youth are experiencing bullying? I'm actually going to share some of that data with you in just a couple of minutes. So hang on to that one because I do want to get to it. Um, any other questions on this piece before we move forward? Clarifications? Okay. So I'll keep trying to keep up with them as we go. If more come in, then um, I encourage you to just keep submitting your questions. Let's talk about the nature of bullying. I want to share with you some information about the nature of bullying that comes from the Attorney General. And as we go through these, I want to encourage you to think about what this sounds like to you. Uh, aside from bullying, what else this reminds you of? So first, I saw there's a question that popped up, and I'm going to come back to that one. First of all, it's done by somebody with more power to somebody with less power. Second, the bully blames the target for the abuse. And third, the target blames him or herself for the abuse. So look at these three together. Done by somebody with more power to somebody with less power. The abuser blames the target. The target blames himself or herself. What does this remind you of? Take a minute and let me know what, what it makes you think of right away. Okay, a number of you said domestic violence, intimate partner violence, domestic violence among adult populations, yep, relationship violence or teen dating violence. Okay, workplace violence, somebody mentioned gang violence, sexual assault. Okay, great. Thanks to all of you who submitted some information here. So, you know, I really feel like when we look at it this way again, this says to me, how seriously do we take issues like gang violence? How seriously do we take issues of uh, relationship violence? domestic violence, these are things that we take very, very seriously. And now that's not to say that we're always addressing them the way that we need to be. But we do consider these issues things that we need to pay attention to, things that require very serious attention. We have policies, all of these kinds of things. Somebody else mentioned self-harm. And we don't always look at bullying the same way, again, because it's something that we're so accustomed to. It's a level of violence in our society that we are just accustomed to. 
So somebody submitted a question, does bullying behavior differ much between boys and girls? For example, are boys more likely to be physical and girls verbal? Um, I don't have data on hand. There is certainly research that speaks to some of this, but one resource that I would mention, again, the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center did a study recently looking specifically at girls and cyberbullying. And one of the things they did find was that girls were more likely to be involved in cyberbullying. Boys were more likely to be involved in face-to-face um, -face or in-person bullying. And a lot of that certainly seems to be about um, communication styles. So obviously none of those are across the board. Um, but it does say something about um, how people tend to interact with other folks. So I think that um, when we look at in-person bullying behavior, we do probably see some differences even there um, among genders. So let me try to get to a couple of these questions too. So somebody had said, do bullies normally target one or multiple victims? I'm not sure that I have uh, data on that one, but certainly anecdotal evidence says that um, people who tend to pick on somebody else, that occasionally it's personal, but more often it has to do with the bully himself or the bully herself. And so then we often tend to see multiple victims, though not necessarily at the same time. So I want to go back to the first one here, um, done by somebody with more power to somebody with less power. And I want to talk a little bit about what it is that gives a kid power. Because we tend to talk a lot about um, Sorry, I got distracted by another question. I want to come back to this one, too. Um, we tend to talk a lot about adults and power, but we don't tend to think about kids and power so much. So I want to just go through a couple of these um, and think about what some of these mean. So here's one piece. Oh, I got the wrong button. So here's one piece. So money. Money is something that gives a kid power, and that can have to do with family money. It can have to do with their own earning power. It can also be about class status, which may or may not be related to money. Fashion is a big one, right? Now, a lot of urban public schools even are moving towards uniform policies, um, partly because of this reason. And um, people assume that that takes a lot of fashion stuff off the table. But in fact, we know that it does make things better, but it doesn't necessarily resolve the issue. Social skills. And I'm not talking about you know, being able to play the trombone or the flute, but more the kinds of social skills that tend to be widely respected among different students or among large groups of students. Body size is another one, of course, right? Small for girls, big and muscular for guys. Popularity. Right? You get power from popularity. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be the queen bee. It just means that you're more popular than the person you're bullying. So you may have one friend who's backing you up, but you may pick on somebody or bully somebody who doesn't have any friends. Um, that's a form of popularity right there. And then, of course, toys and stuff, um, owning things that are coveted by others. These are all kinds of things that give a kid power. And of course, there's charisma, all sorts of untouchable things as well. Uh, but, but these are the kinds of things that people can sort of take on or acquire or that may be sort of inherent. And um, because this is often about power, one of the things that we assume is that bullies are, you know, that they're isolated, that they're antisocial. That's sort of a common myth. But in actuality, a lot of the times what we see is that bullies are kids who are very popular among other kids, and they're, and they're students who are very popular among teachers and among adults and community-based organizations as well because they have that sort of social prowess. So let me see if I can get to a couple of these questions. Um, somebody asked if bullies are more likely to have difficult home environments or parents or adults in their lives that discourage non-conforming behavior, especially gender. You know, not necessarily. Um, this is learned behavior, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, learn, you know, I would say difficult home lives are certainly one reason why kids can bully, because when you don't feel like you have a lot of power, you may feel like you get power by bullying other people, but certainly it's not something that is true all across the board. Let's talk a little bit about why kids bully. So I want to hear from you. Um, lots of questions are coming up around these kinds of things. And I want to know from you, if bullying is done by somebody with more power to somebody with less power, you know, and all these other pieces that we've been talking about, what's behind it? What are some of the things that you're seeing? Okay, insecurity, giving themselves more power, boosting their own self-confidence, somebody mentioned. 
drama. Yeah, that's a good one. That's true because they can. Yeah, making other people laugh. Somebody else mentioned insecurities, culture. Right, this is a really important one. Um, distracting attention from themselves to get an audience. Um, somebody mentioned, I think this is also similar to distracting somebody, that they may be gay, but they don't want other people to know. That could go for a lot of things, too. These are coming in so fast I can hardly keep up, but let me see what else I can do. Um, when parents lose power over the child, maintaining social status. Somebody said dating and abuse. Lashing out in response to abuse they themselves suffer. Absolutely. This is where we talk about it being learned behavior. And somebody else mentioned recreation of trauma. I think a similar way of framing the same thing. Lack of values training. Um, let's see, to have a voice. Somebody mentioned anger. Uh, let's see, are there other things here too? Language and race, TV violence, right, again, so getting back to it being a learned behavior. Belief that the adults approve. This is a really big one, and we'll talk more about that one too. Um, showing off and impressing others. They've seen other people doing it. They don't know better. Uh, Let's see, parents often tell children when someone makes fun of somebody else that they're just jealous. That may not be helpful. That's true. A lack of empathy. Oh, you guys are good. Let's see, somebody said poor impulse, impulse control. Um, kids are being bullied at home, and they have the power to be a bully themselves. An inability to resolve conflict in healthy ways. Okay, you all are great. This is way more, thing, way more things than we have possibly time to talk about right now. And they're still coming in. Let me read a couple more, and then we'll keep going. Um, parent expectations, right? People say, don't even come home if you can't stand up for yourselves. Uh, recreation of trauma. I feel like I missed a couple of these here, but we'll see where we go. We'll keep talking about them. So I wrote up a slide that mentions a couple of these things, but I think you really came up with all of these and more, right? So to look cool, to fit in, avoid being targeted. It feels good. It looks good, right? So if you're trying to detract attention from yourself, um, if you're trying to get attention for positive reasons, right, it feels powerful because they don't know what the alternative is. This certainly gets to a lot of the issues around culture, around learned behaviors, these kinds of things. And so here's the thing. Again, bullying is learned behavior. But what we know about learned behavior is that it can be unlearned. And so if we understand what this comes from, this helps us look a little bit better, a little bit more carefully at ways that we can help people unlearn it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Okay, somebody mentioned the sound is going in and out a lot. I'm going to try to, I'm sure going to, try to be louder and see if this helps. Um, somebody else asked if we're going to get the slides, and yes, you will get the slides. And, um, and the slides that you'll get will also include my citations for the data that I'm going to share with you. So. Let's talk about, we're going to come back to how we address it, but let's talk a little bit about what effect does bullying have on youth. And what I want to know from you is, what are the things that you've seen? And this can go for the bullies, this can go for the kids who are being bullied, and this can go also for bystanders and for other folks who are seeing it. What kinds of things are you seeing? Okay, so of course, right, retaliation, bullying others. Kids get desensitized and they distrust people. It limits their potential, low self-esteem, depression. You all are so good. School dropouts, a lot of things that have to do with depression and reduced self-esteem, lower academics performance, uh, kids not going to school, suicidality, fear, increased risk of suicide, self-injury behaviors, absolutely. Create roles that are perceived by others to be strong. That's a really important one, and we'll talk about this. PTSD, which is certainly um, sort of a, a higher gradation of a lot of these things, too. Drug abuse. Let me just look through these quickly and see what else has come in. Weight loss, engagement in illegal behavior. Absolutely. Drop out of sports and after school activity. Weight gain, also weight loss, all different kinds of disordered eating. Okay, as somebody else mentioned, alcohol and drugs. Lack of trust in the adults who they feel should be protecting them. Right, poor relationship choices, so um, things that can lead to situations where folks might be um, physically or emotionally abused, where there might be sexual assault or date rape, where people might be making um, choices that are not keeping them safe in terms of the sexual decisions that they're making. Um, somebody mentioned hypersexuality. 
isolation. They're still coming in. Okay. Somebody also mentioned victims acting out their bullying on younger children or on animals. Yeah, distrusting authority. You all are great. So I wrote up some of these again. My list is not nearly as comprehensive as the one that you came up with. But I want to share some of the data that surrounds what you all obviously have seen or what you already know by instinct. Um, one thing that I want to mention is that compared to their peers, kids who are bullied are five times more likely to be depressed. And when we look at this list, a lot of the things that you mentioned, um, including the things that are on this list and many of the others, they tend to be related to depression. We know that depression among youth particularly can play out in lots of different ways. Um, so this is a, a huge one. And um, I also just want to mention the medical problems, which is something that didn't come up quite as much. Victims of bullying are much more likely to suffer physical problems. All the things that we know that can come up from stress, like GI issues, um, and we also have evidence that say that kids who are dealing with bullying are more likely to get common colds, coughs, sore throats, poor appetite, night waking, some things that we uh, associate with stress, but some things that we don't necessarily think about being part of um, a reaction to stress. And yet the data really is still there. So um, somebody had mentioned something about the audio. I am going to try to be better about speaking directly into the phone. You'll keep letting us know if it's a problem. So. Let's do some of these numbers. Now, I'm not a data person, so I'll try not to do any death by numbers, but I do feel like it's important to share some of this because this is the stuff that really does drive it home. And I know some questions have come up around some of these, questions, around some of these issues. So first, this is from a 2007 study, and I should say all the data that I'm going to share with you right now is national. 32% uh, of students aged 12 to 18 reported being bullied at school during the school year. So a third of all students aged 12 to 18 in the entire country reported being directly bullied themselves. So this doesn't even just go for kids who have been uh, bullied, uh, who are witnessing it or who are participating in the actual bullying. This is just the kids who have been bullied. And when we narrow that number down to sixth graders, that number actually goes up to almost 43%. Here's one that some of you might be more familiar with. This is from the GLSEN National School Climate Survey. Nine out of 10 gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender students reported being bullied, 90%. So when we look at safety in school, perceptions of safety in school, here's what we've got. More than 60% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual students reported feeling unsafe because of their sexual, unsafe in school, because of their sexual orientation. And when we look at transgender youth, about 90% of them, again, report feeling unsafe in school. So 60% of LGB youth and 90% of transgender youth are reporting not feeling safe in school because of bullying. These are huge numbers. And when we look at how this actually plays out, here's what we're looking at. The number of times per day that youth who are GLBT or who are perceived to be GLBT are hearing anti-gay slurs. So if you can do the math in your head for the school day, what this comes down to is about every 15 minutes, all day, every day. So you have somebody in your ear going faggot, faggot, faggot all day long. How much algebra are you learning? So even the kids who are going to school are missing an awful lot because they're spending an awful lot of time worrying about their safety. When we look at these numbers in the big picture, again, so this is not just about GLBT youth, this is all youth, 30% of all child suicides are directly related to bullying, so a third. And that's those that we can actually track because, of course, when somebody has committed suicide, we don't always have all the answers. Again, this is a national number. GLBT youth are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual classmates. And we have data that correlates the frequency of bullying to the likelihood of attempting suicide. And a lot of this is correlated directly because of to to toxic environments where anti-gay bullying can thrive. Two more for you, and then I'm going to take questions. I'm on the wrong page. Let me get back here. Okay, so two out of three. In two-thirds 
of recent school shootings for which the shooter was still alive to report after the fact the attackers had previously been bullied. This is from the Department of Justice, and then in their report they wrote, in those cases, the experience of bullying appeared to play a major role in motivating the attacker. So this is two-thirds in which the shooter was still alive, and we know often, unfortunately, school shootings end in suicide of the shooter. So there are a lot that we don't have answers to, but we still came up with a pretty high number. Um, and again, of course, this goes back to what we saw in Columbine. And this last one, this is a really significant one. 4%, this is based on student reports of the number of bullying incidents where teachers intervened. All right, students reported that teachers responded or intervened 4% of the time. And this sounds like an awful number. It's abysmal, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But I do want to say this. The number in some ways is also hopeful to me because often when I do these trainings in person, people say to me, I just don't have the time or the capacity to be able to respond to every single thing that happens, every single thing that I hear. I can't do it. And you know, you have a lot of competing priorities. Everybody's budgets are tight. Everybody has too much on their plate. But what this 4% number says to me is you don't have to be perfect in order to make a difference. So if 4% is the number for your school or for your agency, and you were to get that number to 25%, you would have made a significant concrete difference in the experience of the youth that you're working with. This is real stuff. So questions about any of these? Clarification, anything you need me to repeat? Anything else about that data that I just shared with you? I'll give this one just a minute. I know sometimes it takes folks a minute to absorb data. Okay. So one question came up about how we measure the threshold of what is okay. Um, I'm not entirely clear if this is based on what is okay for the youth or what or sort of how much we can live with. So let me try to answer. Let me try to answer both. Um, the threshold again. You know, those of you who have done training around sexual harassment, which is probably many of you, know again that if something is not okay with the person who's experiencing it, that's the definition of it being a problem. Now we know in some cases it may be about a misunderstanding. It may be about um, somebody having said something that is genuinely offensive, but it wasn't meant to be offensive, and somebody can apologize. Apologies accepted, they move on. Certainly those things happen, but in general the threshold for determining what's not okay is if the person who's being targeted or another per person who's witnessing it is having a problem with what's been said or what's been done. If that didn't answer the question, I would encourage you, the person who submitted that question, to write in and try to clarify that for me, and I'll try to do a better job. Um, somebody asked a question about the 4% number. This is, again, regarding teacher intervention. Um, this is based on a national survey, and I can share with you um, the source when you get the slides after the fact. Basically, the question was asked was, how often um, are teachers intervening? And I think that they uh, were able to cross-tab some numbers based on how many incidents teachers intervened, how many incidents teachers had, or how many incidents um, students had been a part of or had witnessed. Um, within a certain time period. I'd have to look at the study again to tell the exact details, but that's how they arrived at those 4% numbers. Okay, um, let's see. And the question that also came up is, how are you defining intervention? And this is an important question, and I want to get back to this in a little bit more detail, but briefly right now, intervention was defined as something that the students understood to be there's bullying and a teacher stepped in to do something. So it actually can encompass any number of things. The catch here, and this is what can be difficult sometimes for the adults working in these settings, is that sometimes adults will choose to intervene in a way that's not public. And that may be an appropriate intervention. I mean, certainly we need to be uh, careful about not sort of shaming people and making it worse um, and creating a situation that might lead to retaliation. But if the person who is being targeted or somebody else is witnessing it doesn't actually see the intervention, it doesn't have much of an impact on their perception of safety. So the actual number may be different, um, but I think that the student perception of it is really important all the same. So now let me try to get to some of these other questions. Um, 
let's see, somebody wanted to know the actual source of the 4%, so let me go back to this. You know, my notes actually, I've got, um, this is something that I pulled from the Nas National Association of School Psychologists, and I do have the website address here where I got it. Um, so off the top of my head, I actually can't remember which study this was, but I have the citation, and I'm happy to forward that to you. Okay, one more, and then I'm going to keep moving forward. So um, somebody mentioned, I think it's problematic to think of bullying only in terms of how it's received by the target. So there may be two kids who jokingly call each other gay or fag and don't mind, but it creates a large environmental problem that requires an intervention. Um, you are absolutely right. This is a little bit different because, again, bullying is defined based on the perception of the person who's hearing it. So technically that doesn't include bullying. However, it is a very important thing because it is something that can contribute to an environment where the people who are involved in the conversation may understand that nothing detrimental or harmful or insulting is meant, but other people around them may not hear anything. Um, I don't want to get too far off track with this one, but I do want to say, because this comes up a lot, especially around words like queer and fag, um, there's a lot of sort of in-group, out-group stuff, and I think that this is an exact parallel in some ways to the N-word, which is to say that um, it's basically, it's almost never appropriate for somebody who doesn't identify as part of the community. And within the community, there is no consensus on whether the word is okay or not. Though many people within the community use it in a way that doesn't mean anything harmful at all. As an adult, I think in, in that setting, whether or not you are a part of that community, whatever community we're talking about, um, I think that your responsibility is to talk with the kids who are using the words in that context and to do this in a way where the other kids who are present also are part of the conversation about why different words can be used in different ways and be very clear that you want to be sure that nobody who's there believes that anybody is insulting anybody else there and that nobody there believes that you think that that kind of insult is okay. So there are ways of addressing it in a culturally competent kind of way. Um, without necessarily shutting it down, but without just sort of letting it go because you feel like, well, I'm not part of the community and it's not my job to tell them what words they can use or not use. Um, one question that just came up, sort of a housekeeping question, and somebody wanted to know if you can view questions from others in the room. I do want to say Brandy actually has a log of all the questions that were submitted. And if it's helpful, one of the things that we can do after this is over is we can um, you know, sort of summarize a lot of the questions and put them in a document. I can send it out to all of you. And um, I can try to answer some of those questions in writing as well as answer some of the questions that we don't get to during this webinar itself. So um, I believe the audio, the audio will be archived. Is that right, Brandy? Yes, it will. It will okay. be archived and available as a podcast on our website. Thank you. Okay, great. So I want to move forward a little bit. I know that um, uh, what am I trying to say? I know that I haven't answered all the questions, but I do want to make sure that we're able to stay within our time frame. So again, I'm going to move forward, and I'll try to keep answering them as I can. And then again, we will have some time set aside at the end to be able to uh, manage any that we haven't gotten to before. I know there were a few from way back when, too, that still haven't been answered. So let's talk about how we address all this. Now this is from our good friend, Yogi Berra, um, of course, who many of you know. He's the guy who was famous for saying things like, I'm going to turn this team around 360 degrees. Um, he's somebody that my mother refer would refer to as Mr. Malaprop. Well, so I asked you at the beginning if any of you had thought of the perfect response to a situation an hour after the situation happened. And here's what Yogi Berra had to say about this kind of thing. You've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. It's genius, right? <laughs> this is part of what makes it hard to respond effectively to these situations. We haven't always thought through what it is that we want to actually get done. So what I want us to do now is take a minute to actually think about this so that, again, the next time the situation comes up, you won't actually need an hour to come up with the perfect response. So tell me, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish when you put prevention strategies in place or when you see something and you intervene. Now, I'm not looking for any one right answer. Your goals are going to be different in different contexts. 
I just want to hear a little bit about what are the kinds of things that you want to accomplish in different set settings um, in terms of setting up your prevention strategies and in terms of creating effective intervention strategies. So I'll encourage you to use the chat window and submit them. I'll try to, answer, I'll try to uh, read out loud as many of these as I can. Okay, these are great. So kids and adults are internalizing the concept of respect, absolutely. Um, teaching healthy communication and interactive, interaction, creating feelings of safety for all students, create safer schools with more respect for all, obviously those go together, to role model appropriate behavior. Yeah, you all are the adults in this situation. Okay, I can hardly even keep up with these. Let me try to stay on top of them here. Um, somebody mentioned having a fairly uniform response throughout the school. This is great. I'm going to come back to that one in a minute too. Um, provoking positive ways to respond to negative situations. Great. Raising awareness, creating empathy, creating strategies for youth to prevent and intervene among themselves. Absolutely. This can't just be all about the adults doing this. Protecting and supporting the victim, of course, um, to have people treated respectfully, to stop the idea that bullying is okay. So we're talking about a culture change here. Teaching skills to change people's behavior. Oh, they keep coming in. I love this crowd. Um, keeping communication and creating a teachable moment, right? Sometimes if we don't respond well, we can actually risk shutting things down. Um, somebody mentioned helping the girls feel safe. She's, I think, in a girls-only environment. Thank you. Um, somebody else wrote in, not shaming the bully. This is a fine art, but an important one. Um, Okay, so a couple other people spoke to the, um, the culture change. So a paradigm shift, get bullies creating, communicating respect, respectfully, um, educating youth, increasing empathy, empathy. Apparently I'm talking too much. I'm losing it. Um, somebody else said teaching the difference between using power over somebody and being empowered. That's great. Um, somebody talked about understanding the impact of their actions and building empathy. And this goes for whether you're talking about an 8-year-old or a 20-year-old. Um, create more or encourage more dialogue. Um, how to respond as the bystander. Somebody mentioned having teachers and parents understand the extent of the problem, how to intervene. Somebody else mentioned regulating your own emotional response. Yeah, I gave you the example of the response that I gave to the child who called another child a faggot at the summer camp. Clearly I had a very emotional response there and I didn't do such a great job. Um, Let's see, somebody else mentioned helping the target to feel like they have some control. Great, so this gets back to the idea of empowerment, encouraging healthy youth development, um, identifying bullies' personal issues. Yeah, so what is it again that's behind this and how can we address it in a way that's supportive and helpful and, and constructive? Um, and then somebody else mentioned again, increasing the power of the victim. So you all are, are great. Um, and I love the way you're thinking through this. Again, all these different kinds of things are um, appropriate in different contexts. Of course, you're going to have more than one goal depending on what the situation is. Somebody else mentioned helping people identify what bullying isn't. Um, so not just shutting things down, but also you know, creating sort of more effective constructive responses. So again, here's my, um, my pre-done PowerPoint slide, which of course doesn't nearly represent all of the kinds of things that you mentioned. Um, but I hope encapsulates some of the things that we're thinking about. So stopping the behavior, protecting the target, protecting bystanders, upholding policies, so your school or agency policies, upholding your school or agency values, which may or may not be spelled out in your policies, upholding your own values. Again, you know, if you let something go because you don't know how to respond to it, by not responding, you may accidentally be giving somebody else the impression that you're fine with what's being said. Um, creating a learning opportunity, creating a safe learning environment. I think you all more than covered all of these things. Um, there's a couple more that came in. I just want to get to these two. To make the bullies aware of their maladaptive behavior, be able to change their behavior. Change their response to people in situations that are considered weird or other. Um, this is also, again, about a culture change, that it's not necessarily a problem to not be the same as everybody around you. Now, particularly for those of you at the middle school and high school level, that can be a tough one. Uh, but it's an important one, right? Uh, we also talked about encouraging bystanders to join in and prevent, in preventing and changing the culture. And somebody else mentioned this is great, making the connection between bullying and other power dynamics. So you all saw very clearly earlier when I talked about the nature of bullying, you know, the connection between sexual assault, domestic violence, gang violence, other issues, 
And again, you know, kids, just like adults, tend to think that bullying is just something that happens. It's a rite of passage. And when we're able to make those connections for them or help them draw those connections, it can make a difference in how they respond. And it can make a difference in what they actually say, depending on sort of which end of it they're on. And of course, we're not necessarily talking about one group of people who are the bullies and one group of people who are the targets or the bystanders, because there's certainly a lot of overlap, particularly, again, with cyberbullying, but with all kinds of bullying. So here is my question for you. Now that we know where it is that we want to go, what is it that we actually do about it? So I'm going to share with you some best practices, but I want to start by actually talking about what doesn't work. So here we are. Here's our very sad polar bear. <laughs> I wanted to talk about four different things that are often used as a response to bullying that are just not very helpful. I want to be sure to clear these up um, right off the bat before we even talk about best practices. So here's the first one. Zero tolerance. Um, zero tolerance is something that schools love to do. Politicians love to talk about it. It's easy to explain, and it's great PR because it looks like you're being tough on bullying. But the reality is zero tolerance casts much too broad of a net. So there was just a story in the paper recently about an eight-year-old boy in Florida. He was expelled last November because he brought a toy gun to school. And of course, the, the policy was no weapons in school. So he was expelled, and then just recently the school board recommended that he not be returned to the mainstream public school, but that he be moved to a correctional school. Now, I am not trying to say that we shouldn't take these things seriously, but the data on these kinds of responses, this sort of wild response to a child bringing a toy gun to school one time without having any actual conversation, just kicking him out of school, is these responses have no positive impact on school safety. They don't work. Um, they mean that children who are displaying antisocial behavior are often denied role models of healthy adults and peers. They might be more likely to display additional antisocial behavior down the line. And the same thing goes really for the three strikes and you're out policy. Um, the other thing about both zero tolerance and three strikes and you're out is that both of these policies discourage reporting because people are afraid that when the punishment is that severe that there's going to be retaliation. The second myth that I want to bust here is mediation. Sometimes people want to take kids to mediation when there's been bullying. Um, this cartoon is a great illustration of when mediation is appropriate. Right? Mediation is designed to help people work things out between them when either they both have valid points of view or they both are somewhat in the wrong. Bullying, let me be very clear about this, bullying is victimization. It's not a conflict to be resolved any more than domestic violence or child abuse is a conflict to be resolved by mediation. We wouldn't consider it for domestic violence, we wouldn't consider it for child abuse, and we certainly shouldn't be considering it for mediation. The message that the bully really needs to hear is, your behavior is inappropriate and it needs to stop. And beyond that, if I haven't convinced you already, I will say there is no evidence at all that mediation actually works to deal with bullying. The third myth that I want to address is group therapy for the bullies. Group therapy can actually make children's behavior worse because what happens is that group members end up serving as role models for each other and they re reinforce each other's antisocial and negative behavior. So it's not a helpful one. And this last one, this is a much less egregious problem and a much more widespread one, a piecemeal approach. And I want to say this. It's not that small changes don't work. And it's not that you shouldn't try to do things a little bit differently or things in a more effective way yourself or to keep working on this yourself if you don't have an administration behind you. But the reality is if there's no comprehensive strategy, they may not stick or they may not have much of an impact on the environment, or they may serve mainly to push bullying from one place to another. Right? We all know the teacher who is um, out there herself or himself in a high school, the one who is really great at dealing with bullying, at intervening, at creating a really respectful environment or his or her classroom. But because there's not a system-wide effort in that school, we know that people consider that classroom the safe place and the bullying happens elsewhere. Right? And some of this, you know, we say, well, it may or may not be inevitable, but the fact is that a comprehensive strategy is going to be much more effective. That to reduce the prevalence of bullying, 
we really need a change in the climate of the school or of the agency and its exceptions for student behavior. Um, so a couple questions came in that I want to address. Um, one person, okay, let me try to, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, it was about whether school needs to be strict about this to avoid the bullying, um, if it will help reduce the number of bullying and the number of suicides. Um, you'll forgive me, and I'm going to ask the person who just submitted that question to help clarify for me a little bit. Um, the school needing to be strict about what? I'm not quite sure. So let me give you a minute to respond, and I'll move on to the next question. Um, somebody asked for clarification about what is piecemeal. So a piecemeal approach basically is, um, as opposed to having a systematic or a systemic approach that this person is trying this and this person is trying this, rather than there being sort of one kind of uniform way that everybody in a school or everybody in an agency is trying to address this, that you haven't trained everybody, you've only trained different groups of people, or you know, you've talked to some of the students about it but not the adults. Um, it's really an approach that is not comprehensive. Um, any other questions about this? Just give this a minute. Okay, the person who submitted her question before that I wasn't quite sure about hasn't clarified for me, so I'm going um, to hang in, and if you want to clarify for me, then I will try again. Okay, so I got way ahead of myself here. Okay, so let's talk about, oh, where did we go? Forgive me. There we go. Okay, so let me try again. So here's your takeaway points. So this is the stuff that doesn't work. Again, I'm happy to um, share the resource for this. There's a great website that's called findyouthinfo.gov. Um, for those of you who are not note takers, that's fine. I'm going to share this um, in a slide with you at the end, and you'll get it in your handouts as well. But findyouthinfo.gov, um, you can just do a quick search for bullying. and um, they have uh, lots of resources on this, but this is where um, I came up with these pieces that don't work so well. So again, zero tolerance, mediation, group therapy, and a piecemeal approach. So now a couple more questions have come in. Um, do teachers or adults ever report feeling, I think there's a word missing in this question. Let me try that again. Okay, do teachers or adults ever report feeling bullied by their colleagues or by the youth who are bullying and does this have an effect on the intervention? Um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, I guess the question is whether um, adults are bullying each other or whether the youth are bullying the teachers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and absolutely it does have an effect on the intervention because if somebody feels like they're being targeted uh, themselves, then you know, they're playing a different kind of role than you might be playing if you're a bystander, whether you're a young person or an adult. Um, so again, this speaks to, I think, why it's important to have a comprehensive approach because it means that everybody's backing up everybody else in that system, at least in the ideal world. Uh, okay, so somebody mentioned, if I can repeat the site again in writing. Um, so again, it was findyouthinfo.gov. And um, like I said, this is going to be a slide that you'll get at the end so you can come back to this one. Let me try to get to some of these other questions here. Okay, how can we have a comprehensive approach when there are teachers that bully students? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to get to some of the comprehensive approaches in just a minute because we're going to get to um, best practices. And I guess the very short answer before we get into it in more detail is we have to understand that bullying does not just come from the youth. And when we're creating a comprehensive approach, we have to take this into account, that we can't just assume this is only coming from the young people. We also have to deal with it among the adults. And we'd like to think that adults don't need to wield power over youth, that they have it you know, sort of intrinsically. But of course, we all know better. We all know that that's not the case. And sometimes there are adults who push youth around just because they can for the same reason that youth bully other, other youth or that adults bully other adults. Um, it can really be about power and learned behavior and a culture that supports it. So I want to move forward and talk about some of the best practices. I don't want to leave you with just the things that don't work. So there are really five steps to doing this well. I'm going to name them all, and then I'm really going to go through them one at a time. So now you'll forgive me. I just got myself into the wrong place. Hang on one second here. Okay, there we are. Here's where you're going to start. So you're going to start by assessing the situation. And then you're going to focus in on 
what it is that you're actually trying to do. From there, you're going to get your support in place. You're going to figure out what you're going to do, and you're going to implement it. And then, last but not least, you're going to sustain it. Now, I make it sound so simple, don't I? <laughs> um, it's just like that. Five steps, and you're there. Let's talk a little bit more about each of these in detail. So we'll start with the assessment. I want to say right off the bat, don't assume that you know what's going on in your school or agency. Remember that the perspective that you have is really valuable, and it's real, and it's not the only perspective. So you need to start by getting information from the source. And of course, the source in this case is the youth. And of course, it may also be the other adults. Um, anonymous surveys are a great way to do this. Many, many schools have come up with all sorts of surprises about what's really going on by doing anonymous surveys. Um, you can use the survey to assess how much, where it's happening, when it's happening, what kind it is, who's doing it. You can find out which groups are dealing with more bullying than others, which can help you sort of prioritize what your approach might look like. The other thing that you can do with a survey is you can measure intervention. So I want to just give you one example. We worked with one school where we did surveys both of the teachers and the students, and we asked them about their perceptions. We asked the teachers, how often do you intervene when you see something come up? And then we asked the students, how often do the teachers intervene? Because we wanted to be able to compare their perceptions. And this probably won't surprise you, we came up with wildly different answers. The teachers reported that they were intervening way more than the students thought the teachers were intervening. And this told us two things. One is that the teachers were probably not aware of how much bullying was really happening. They were probably intervening much more frequently in proportion to what they saw than they were in proportion to what was actually going on, of course. And the second thing it told us is that teachers may be intervening, but in ways that students don't see or in ways that they don't necessarily perceive as effective. So even though they're intervening, the interventions are not doing a whole lot to help them feel safe. So we were able to actually do a lot with that data right there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, one person asked, do I have any interview forms or information on what forms have been useful to assess youth perceptions of bullying? Um, I want to follow up with you about this one. I can follow up with everybody about this one um, after the training. Um, we do have some resources. It's something that we can certainly help you um, design a survey if you wanted to do something tailored. And there are some great examples of um, pre-made things also out there on the web. And I'd be happy to get you some of those resources um, after the fact. So. When you look at your assessment, these are all the different kinds of things that you're looking at. Um, again, so where, what kind, how often, and who. And then the question that comes up is, what do you do with the data when you have it? Sometimes, again, seeing the data is just enough to make a difference. So there's two examples here. The first is when we showed teachers at the school that we surveyed the students' perceptions of how often they intervened, and we came up, we saw that big gap, they were shocked. Uh, but having that information, first of all, it motivated them to speak up more often and to be more clear when they intervene. So just sharing the data with them made them more effective, even without doing skills training. The other piece is, another question we asked on our survey was about how many students were okay with the bullying they witnessed, and whether they believed that other students were okay with it. And it turned out that most people were not okay with it, but they thought everybody else was. And that made them less likely to intervene. So just sharing that data with the students about the real numbers by itself, again, it encouraged more student intervention because they knew they had support. Um, you can also use the data to help you tailor a bullying prevention curriculum. And of course, last but not least, and this always comes up with funding, it gives you a baseline so that you can actually measure your progress. Bullying, as you know, is a hot issue right now. There is money out there to help school systems and community-based ag agencies implement bullying programs. And if you have some data, it gives you a much stronger case. So step two, if this is going to work, you need to really focus on the climate at your school or your agency, the overall climate. You need to create an atmosphere where it's not cool to bully, where it is cool for bystanders to intervene, and where it's the norm for staff and students to notice when a child is being bullied. So it's not enough just to look at the behavior of the young person who's the biggest offender. Uh, but you really need to look at the big picture. 
So again, the atmosphere. These are the things that you are looking to do. You want to discourage bullying, encourage bystander intervention, and create a norm where people notice when bullying is happening and know what to do about it. So they know about reporting, all these different pieces. The third piece, and this also has to do with changing your climate, is you need to get support, and this means everyone. Teachers, parents, bus drivers, maintenance crew, cafeteria staff, administrators, students. Sometimes schools and agencies will call me and they want me to do training on bullying for their students as a way of addressing the bullying. Maybe for their student council leaders or for their peer mediators. And I'll say to them, you know, you can't do this without the students, but if the adults aren't on board, you're setting the students up for failure and vice versa. So let's talk about what implementation actually looks like. All right, so here's the first piece, of course, your policies. You've got to have your policies in place. And there are great sample policies available online from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And again, I'll give you that link at the end of the training. Um, they created these ahead of the new bullying law that's going to be implemented this winter. And I will say policies are like guidelines, right? If you don't need them, great. But if you need them and they don't say what you need them to say, you're out of luck. So the first thing that you want to do with your policies is you want to spell out your values. Um, I want to mention that only 11 states offer policies on harassment and bullying in schools that are fully inclusive of LGBT students, meaning the policies include sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender presentation. So if you live in one of the states that doesn't have this kind of coverage, you can use your policies as an opportunity to create this protection in your own school or in your own agency despite the gap in student law. The second thing you need to do with your policies is you need to include both bullying and retaliation. Obviously, fear of retaliation is a big deterrent against reporting. Uh, there was a question that one, one person wanted to know if Massachusetts is one of the states that does. Massachusetts does include sexual orientation, but, we, but it does not include gender identity or expression at this point. And that's something that we're hoping will change within the year. Uh, but it is not at this point. Um, somebody else wanted to know what states those are. Um, I can't give you the list off the top of my head, but I'd ha be happy to follow up with you and um, get you all that information. There is a map online. The third thing you want to do with your policies is, is you need to include cyberbullying. It needs to be specific because this is a huge issue. And the last thing that you need to do in your policies is define what areas are actually covered by the policy. So does it include the school bus? Does it include school or agency related activities that take place off site? Um, does it include technology that's owned by your school or owned by your agency but used by a younger person off site? These kinds of things are really important because it really defines what is your reach for actually addressing these things. And it helps with that issue that we've all seen where we create one safe space and it pushes bullying elsewhere. So this helps us create a more comprehensive approach. So you've got your policies in place. And the next thing you need to look at is professional development. So I want to say that if the adults who work in the school or the agency don't know what the policies say, they can't enforce them. And don't assume that they already have the skills to be effective in preventing and addressing bullying. They need skills training. They need factual information. They need definitions of bullying. They probably need a crash course on cyberbullying. And this may even include a basic social media 101. Um, sometimes people don't understand cyberbullying for the simple reason that they don't really understand how kids are using the technology and how a person can possibly bully somebody else that way. You need to share with them, again, local data. So the stuff that you came up with based on your survey, um, statewide data if it's available can also be really useful. And something that we've also done when we've done uh, trainings in schools or agencies is beforehand, we've asked the training coordinator to go to the youth in that school or agency and to ask them anonymously to each write up a few sentences about their experiences with bullying, positive and negative, because that can really drive it home for folks. You need, again, to make sure that you're developing their skills. Um, one of the things that I would suggest to do is providing a script for your staff that actually gives them words for an intervention. So it doesn't mean that everybody has to stick to the exact wording. Um, and obviously different situations call for different kinds of interventions. But in schools that I've worked with where they've created a script, they've actually reported back that the adults are much more likely to intervene because they feel like they have a tool to work with. 
Um, one person mentioned they would go a step further to say that faculty in the school should be involved in creating the policies and not just becoming familiar with them. Um, like a set of group or classroom rules, they're much more likely to follow it themselves. Absolutely. Involving them in that process is great because it really does improve, increase their investment in what it is that you're trying to do. Thank you for that suggestion, Robin. Okay. Um, I want to give you an example of, one, of a script that one school I worked with developed to help adults deal with the sort of that's so gay kind of comments. Um, obviously, it wasn't used in the same way every time, but just to, you know, just to give some, put some words in your head. This is what they came up with. It's not okay to say that because it's offensive to me. I know you're not the kind of person who wants to hurt others, and I want everybody here treated with respect. Remember, one of our core values here is respect for self and others. So short and to the point, we know the reality is that it often got boiled down even more than that, but those were four or five sentences that they came up with to give every adult in the school the same baseline, and kids heard it over and over again. Once you've gotten through, uh, or once you've addressed and put a plan in place for your professional development, you need to look again at the student or the youth involvement. There are a number of ways to do this. I certainly recommend using a combination. They need training on intervention skills. Of course, you can do this with a bullying curriculum, which should help to build empathy. Uh, bullying, again, it's so common that many young people start to think of it as a way of life. Sometimes, again, just introducing them to a reality that doesn't have to include bullying is enough to get them thinking about how they can help create it. Um, one reference that I want to give you is Teaching Tolerance. Many of you already know about this, but it, they have great curricula for students on bullying. Uh, many of them are free, and they have a new video out specifically about anti-gay bullying. So I'll share the website with you at the end of the session, but if you haven't already seen them, I recommend that you check them out. They do a great job. Students need to be clear about the reporting process. It should include anonymous reporting, options and also confidential reporting options, and they should know about your policy regarding retaliation. The third piece is group perspective. So again, I mentioned before, sharing with them the data that said, you know, most of you are not okay with it, but most of you think the rest of you are okay with it. Giving them that information had a big impact on how they were actually able to respond. So um, this is a really important piece of it. And then the last piece is supporting them for positive action. They need to be able to support each other and to support the adults around them in taking positive, inter well, positive action to prevent or stop bullying. So I want to give you an example. Um, the Gay Straight Alliance at one school that I worked with wrote this fabulous letter. If a Gay Straight Alliance member saw a teacher respond when somebody said that's so gay or step in at any other time when somebody was being bullied, they would send them this letter that said essentially, we saw what you did and it made a real difference. We appreciate you for stepping in. You're making this school a safer place for all of us. So they were giving them positive feedback, and what happened is that teachers started putting the letters on their bulletin boards and in other public places, and then other teachers who hadn't gotten the letter started to ask, well, what can I do to get a letter like this? So it was this very simple effort, but the positive feedback really snowballed and went a long way. Um, there's this sort of movement among a lot of schools that says, like, get caught doing something good, and that's really what we're doing, is giving folks positive feedback for doing something good, for intervening or supporting bullying prevention. And the last piece, oh, I'm going backwards. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm just watching the time, and I want to let folks know we are going to end by 12.30. We will have some more time for questions after that one, too. The last piece is really around supervision. We know, again, a lot of bullying happens in places where the adults are not present. So you need to know where it's happening. Again, this comes back to your survey. And you've got to make an effort to provide better supervision. So student parking lots, cafeterias, the hallway between classrooms, buses, any other hot spots, those are the places where you need to make sure there is a physical presence. You can't be everywhere at once, uh, but there are ways of building student leadership uh, by having them serve in that role in some places, um, depending on the training, depending on what parent involvement looks like at your school. This may be a place where parent volunteers can be helpful, you know, really identifying and, and getting folks there. So when we talk about, for example, reducing underage drinking, you know, we talk about alcohol intervention, we talk about working with parents who are not providing um, alcohol to youth who are underage, but we also work with liquor store owners 
to be able to identify fake IDs, right? So some of this is literally about access. It's not just about changing hearts and minds. It's also about really making it physically more difficult to do. So I want to sort of wrap this up from here, and then I will take some more questions from here and try to get to some of the other ones that um, I haven't gotten to before. Now there's one question that just came in. Do I happen to know if bullying is one of the topics that require active parental consent on surveys? That's a great question, and the answer is no, it's not. Um, of course, once you get it, if you're going to get into great, great detail, um, it may bring up, it may bring in some other issues where parental permission um, might be helpful. But for the most part, you know, if you're asking about bullying, you're asking about harassment. No, you don't have to get active parental consent for them to be able to respond to this. So here's what I want to say about this. This is a quick overview. Okay, I realize it was, um, you know, not a comprehensive piece. But this is sort of an, an introduction. But I want to say this. This stuff is not easy. There is no question about it, but it's worth it. So here you have a picture of my children, <laughs> and these are my reasons for doing this. So when this stuff seems just way more complicated for me to even be able to work through, you know, this is why I do it. This is why I hang in there. And each of you have your own reasons for doing this. Children in your lives, an experience that you had growing up, whatever it is, I encourage you to identify it if you don't know it already and hold on to it as a motivation for when this work feels really daunting and difficult. So I want to share with you again some of these resources that I brought up. Again, you'll get these in writing um, in the slides, so you don't have to feel like you have to write them down. But um, all these I mentioned at different points, um, the Massachusetts DOE, uh, Teaching Tolerance, Find Youth Info, the National Mental Health Association, um, Stop Bullying Now, and OAS, which I don't think I mentioned by name, but which also is a great resource for bullying curriculum. Um, somebody else asked a question of the MARC program. Again, that's the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center, which I had mentioned before. They're a terrific resource, and again, particularly on cyberbullying. Um, and they do offer trainings, and they've got a free curriculum um, that's now available, or it's, it's available free to all Massachusetts schools, and it's a K-5 curriculum. Uh, so that's something that's not so easy to come by. They do a great job. I didn't mention them on here, but I did cite them in the written version of the slides that you'll get um, after the fact. So if you don't um, have that written down already, you will be able to get it from them. So again, I just want to mention to you, of course, that um, some of the things that we offer. So online trainings. This webinar um, will be repeated on October 28th, and uh, we are charging for that one, but we do also offer CEUs. So if any of the other folks um, in your agencies or in your schools are interested in that, you will be getting a save the date. And I would ask you please, if you enjoyed this webinar, to pass it on to anybody else. Um, we do offer agency or school specific training and um, you know, online. So we can offer this webinar and our other online trainings um, as agency or school specific training. So we have additional technical assistance. Uh, we can do some pre and post tests and we can get you some more hard copy materials. And we'll have an online course on GLBT Health in December. And then um, for our on-site trainings, again, available anywhere in Massachusetts and throughout the country, I'd encourage you to check out our website for a full list of the topics that we offer um, and to give us a call if you're interested in doing any on-site trainings. Um, again, we also offer technical assistance, so I would encourage you to call me or email me with any questions after the fact. The assessment stuff. And, um, and resources. We have a number of things. One thing I wanted to mention is on our website available for free download, we have um, what we call a cue card. It's sort of a quick reference guide. Um, it is five ways to respond to anti-gay bullying in school and youth-centered environments. So you can just hop onto our website, which is listed right here. And um, you can just fill out the request form, and the PDF will pop right up for you. Um, here's also our Twitter handle, so I would encourage you to go follow us over there. Um, and it is, it's 12.30 straight up. <laughs> so um, Brandy, I don't know if you want to jump in and say something at this point, any housekeeping stuff before um, we get to some of the other questions? I sure will. Thank you, Marissa. Um, so just so everyone knows, it is officially 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is the official ending of our webinar. However, as Marissa had said earlier, she and I will extend the webinar in order to respond to a few questions. If you have other commitments, then please feel free to leave, and thank you for participating. As Marissa mentioned earlier, the slides will be emailed to you, 
and a podcast of the webinar will be uploaded into the Department of Public Health website, which you'll get all in your email at the conclusion of the webinar. So I'll turn it back over to Marissa, and she'll start to answer any questions that we have. Okay, thanks, Brandy. And I would encourage you to keep submitting your questions. I'll try to get to some of the ones earlier that I missed. Um, one question that came up way earlier, I think, was um, why is this defined as bullying and not harassment? And now I will say, you know, I'm not a lawyer and I don't even play one on TV, um, but my understanding is that when we're talking about harassment, um, more often that's a legal definition that has to do with adults, but it is a pretty fine line. So again, I can't really give you the legal definition, um, but I can certainly point you after the fact to some websites that may help sort of clarify some of the difference there. Um, somebody asked a question. Has any connection been established between physical abuse abuse and, now I just lost the question because more are coming in. Has any connection been established between physical abuse and or being witness to domestic violence in the home and bullying behavior at the school? That's a great question. Um, I don't have any data at my fingertips, but we certainly know that there is a correlation between kids who, wit who have witnessed or experienced violence and kids who are violent to others. So my instinct would be to say that, yes, it probably is something that can make a, a young person more likely to bully or harass other young people. Um, I'm going to just write that one down, and I'm going to try to come up with some of the um, data that's behind it, um, try to find some of the research. So let me just make myself a quick note there. Okay, let me see. Some of the other questions that came in. Oh, let's see. Somebody asked if I can provide the script I, I read under the category of professional development. Um, yes, I can give you those notes. With um, I assume that you're asking about all the different pieces that I mentioned in terms of what should be addressed for professional development. So the answer is yes. And if I didn't answer your question that you were actually asking, uh, then Susan, please do submit it again and let me know that. Okay, somebody else wanted to know, they're wondering about bullying behavior. It says these kids are often vilified, and certainly they do need intervention and discipline. But it seems important to offer kids who have been bullying behavior support services to explore the issues and learn new strategies. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that we, we got to some of this sort of generally before, but one of the things that is really important when we're talking about intervention is how do we manage to do this in a way that doesn't shame doesn't further shame or further victimize the person who's being targeted. And I would say that also goes for the bully. You know, sometimes we think, well, this person is being nasty and we want them to be punished. Uh, but what we know is that if somebody, you know, if somebody comes down really hard on them and creates that kind of shame in front of other kids, that it can actually end up being counterproductive and it has the opposite effect of really creating a situation where people are able to think through things. Now, I want to go back to the survey that we did way at the very beginning. 90% of you, I think, said that the kids, the youngest kids you had ever heard say that's so gay were under like 13. This is really young. And I think that a lot of those kids probably don't necessarily know the meaning of gay. And a lot of those who do know the meaning of gay aren't actually saying that's so gay to mean that something is actually homosexual. They're just using it because they know it's something that's considered negative. And part of our job in intervening around these things is to say, well, is that actually what you meant? Or what did you mean by that? Or why don't you say what it is that you mean? So what's another word that you could say that would describe this homework assignment without insulting anybody? So that's sort of a mild example because certainly we know that kids often say it and they do mean exactly what they're saying. Uh, but I think the point here is you want to create opportunities on the spot and after the fact for the folks who are doing the bullying to really think through what's motivating you to do this and are there other ways that you can get what you need in a constructive way that's not harmful to other people. I hope that at least started to answer the question. Um, somebody asked, when is the new Massachusetts law supposed to be taking effect? And I actually have to say, I don't know the exact date. It is this winter, so my assumption is probably January 1. Um, but I'm going to have to get back to you on the specifics of that one. That should be an easy one to find. Um, now, somebody wrote in and said it's in effect now. I think my understanding is that the piece of the law that's in effect right now is sort of the planning phase, but that schools do have a few more months to get their policies in place and finalized and their, um, 
their training plans finalized. Um, one plug that I will also just mention is that one of the uh, requirements in the policy, thank you Gina, I'm going to say what you just said in a second. One of the requirements of the policy is that um, folks have to do uh, professional development where they can actually get professional development points. And uh, when we're repeating this webinar on bullying, we are able to offer that um, to folks who are working in an educational setting as well as CEUs for folks who need those too. Um, and Gina just wrote in again, thank you, and said plans are due by December, the policies are due by the end of the school year. So we're in the planning phase right now, and um, the policies, I guess, for the end of the school year in, in Massachusetts is usually about June 30th um, or within the week before then. I don't know if I missed any questions from earlier. I'd encourage you, if you have more, to keep submitting your questions. Um, and Brandy, if you happen to notice any other questions, burning questions that came up, before, um, please let me know so I can make sure to try to get to those now. There, there was a few questions, and I'm not sure that you got to them, so I'll just ask. Um, someone earlier asked, does the bully need to blame themselves for it to be bullying? Oh, does the bully need to blame themselves? Mm -hmm. No. The definition of bullying, and let me, let me go way back here in my slides and come back to this one. Bear with me for one second. Okay, here we are. So no, the definition is, is um, so there's the power piece. The abuser blames the target. So it was his fault because he's dressing like a girl. <laughs> you know, that kind of blame comes up. And then it's also about the target eventually blaming himself or herself. Now, it doesn't have to be quite as obvious as, well, I shouldn't have dressed that way because then I wouldn't have gotten bullied. Um, but when we talk about things like depression and low self-esteem, a lot of that is a reflection of a person internalizing some of what they're getting from other people. Um, and that's really what we're talking about when we say the target blames himself or herself. And that's also why we see, you know, for example, self-injurious kind of behaviors like cutting and disordered eating. I have another question, Marissa. Please. That was asked earlier, do bullies normally target one or multiple victims? Um, I think I got to some of this question before. I mean, I think based on what we know about behavior from bullies, it doesn't tend to be only one person who's the target of the abuse. Um, you know, whether it's more than one person or not is a little bit harder to say, though obviously you know, there's this kind of herd mentality that it's certainly easier to bully one person at a time. But that doesn't mean that that's the only person. And were there others? Those are all the questions that I had that went unanswered. Okay, um, so if any, I don't know if there was anybody else who wanted to submit any more questions or if we missed any questions that you submitted before, I would definitely encourage you to um, resubmit them. Okay. Okay. So um, it doesn't seem like any more questions are coming in right now. Um, so again, I'll say you will get a slightly different version of this PowerPoint um, that includes all the citations and um, the websites that I mentioned. And um, if anybody has additional questions, I guess, that I didn't get to, you can email them to me and I will try to get right back to you. And I will um, take a look at the archived questions after the fact and um, try to respond to any of those in writing as well. Um, again, I would encourage you to get onto our website. I'm going to put that up here again. Uh, take a look at our resources, and um, we do have an evaluation for you that will pop up after you log off. I do appreciate your feedback, both positive and constructive. And um, again, your referrals are, are, um, are the best ones. So if you enjoyed this and wanted to share the information about the upcoming webinar with other folks that you work with, I certainly do appreciate that. Um, Brandy, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we sign off? Um, no, I just want to remind people you will be getting all the slides in an email in addition to um, the link for where the webinar is going to be posted on the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's website. And like um, Marissa stated, please fill out the evaluation because we appreciate all um, comments that are made. Other than that, thank you for participating and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Brandy. Thank you. Please stand by.